I'm going to say it again. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. I'll try to <clears throat> I'll try to speak up. I'm looking at this podium. You can't see it. It's filled with electronic gadgets. There's two watches. There's a remote. There's a, a TiVo. Uh, so we know that we have the right person giving our talk on business ethics and information technology. Um, at any rate, my name is Mike Hoffman. I am the executive director of the Center for Business Ethics here at your college, um, at Bentley College, for those who are guests. And uh, I know some people are still coming in, so uh, that's fine. Uh, there are seats down here in front, which I know all students love to have. And um, I want to welcome you to the ninth Verizon <clears throat> uh, visiting professor lectureship, or lecture, I should say, on business ethics and information technology. We have a very exciting program, I think, for you this afternoon. And let me just cover a few uh, ground rules before I make some introductions. <clears throat> uh, the first ground rule is that uh, there's food after the lecture. <laughs> Uh, it's right out here in the uh, in the forum. Uh, there, there's food and drink, um, and also Dr. White will be there. And some of you may want to uh, snuggle up to Dr. White and ask him a few questions about uh, the remarks he has to say this afternoon uh, while you're munching on some more d'oeuvres and uh, having a drink. So please feel free, those of you who do not have classes or other commitments, to uh, join us for the reception immediately following the question and answer uh, session uh, after the lecture. Uh, there will be uh, a Q&A after the lecture, as there always is. And I look forward to helping Dr. White field the questions, uh, particularly those that come from the students, you, most of you, and also we'll have some questions, I suspect, from some of our distinguished guests uh, in, in the area of business ethics in the Boston uh, business community. Uh, but uh, we'll have, hopefully, a lively Q&A after the uh, lecture. Mary, what have I forgotten to say? Maybe I... That's it? Okay. Good. Welcome, and we're glad to have you. I know some of you may have to leave, although the lecture may be so fascinating that you may not want to, even though you have class. If, if you do have to go to class before uh, all of the event is over, uh, please try to do so quietly. Uh, I know these seats, when you get up quickly, go bring, bring, and so if you could just silently hold them down before you... Uh, depart. That would be great. And those of you who can stay for the Q&A, which I hope will be a goodly number of you, uh, you can stay where you are or move down closer to the front after the formal lecture. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Greg Miles, who is the Director of the Office of Ethics and Business Conduct at Verizon. Uh, Greg has flown up from New York in this cold weather uh, to be with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, he's done so in the past as well, and uh, I think he'd like to say a few words. Greg? Thank you. Thank you for that warm reception and those high, kind words, <laughs> Dr. Hoffman. Uh, it is without a doubt a pleasure and an honor for Verizon to sponsor uh, these lectures. I'm very excited about today's topic. Uh, I think it is something that hopefully many of you, if not all of you, will find very interesting, very uh, enlightening and insightful. It's something in, in my uh, industry that we find very dear to us in regard to privacy for our employees as well as our customers. So uh, I had extra incentive in coming up for this afternoon and listening to the lecture. We've had an opportunity to interact with Dr. White before today and provide some information as it relates to Verizon's business uh, products and our position on the efforts in the area of privacy for both our employees and our customers. 
uh, also as it relates to what we do in balancing our legal requirements and those things that we try to do to make sure that our customers feel comfortable and confident that their information is safe with us. I also would encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to answer, ask some questions and get some answers and have some open dialogue. We, those are always very, very helpful in taking something as a walk away from this kind of event. Also, you will see out front, if you haven't gathered any, a Verizon Code of Conduct. Uh, I can tell you that this is a new code of conduct that we issued last year in May of 06, and it is a product that I was intimately involved with uh, and put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and I mean that literally, in getting this <laughs> document together. The last time that I was here, uh, our prior code was still in place, and I had not been a part of ethics organization. I had not taken over leadership of the ethics organization for Verizon. I was managing and, and directing our EEO compliance team at the time, so I didn't have any intimate involvement with the actual code of conduct before. But this one was one of the first priorities that I was uh, embarked upon when I took over the job with the uh, ethics office. So I'm very proud of it. We've received some very positive feedback and some very complimentary comments from people inside and outside of our company about it. So uh, if we can answer any questions for you, there's good information here and telephone numbers. I will be available as well in the lobby afterwards if I can uh, talk with you, answer any questions, be of any assistance to you. Uh, I can tell you again also that um, you know, this Bentley College program is an excellent program and I commend you for taking advantage of it. Uh, they really groom people to understand the business ethics, both in academia and in corporate America, when you leave here. A testimony to that is one of your graduates last year we hired. Anybody know Jamie? No, no, no. What's Jamie's last Jamie name? Curry. There you go, Jamie Carey. Well, she was uh, hired last year by our Verizon Business Unit within Washington, D.C., and is doing an excellent job. So uh, if that's any indication of what you're learning here and what you're capable of doing when you leave. Uh, keep up the good work, Dr. Hoffman. So without any further ado, I'll get to the guest star of the old moment, Dr. White. Thank you, Greg. Um, and thank you for uh, representing Verizon here today. And uh, I'd like to thank Verizon for all of its support over the last nine years or so. It's been a great partnership, and we look forward to that partnership continuing. I'm so happy that you mentioned uh, Jamie Carrier, who worked, some of you may remember Jamie, uh, worked at the Center for Business Ethics for five years, uh, got her, um, uh, her MBA in the area of, uh, I think, finance uh, and economics, but also uh, got her uh, concentration in business ethics as she was getting her MBA and got an excellent job down in Washington DC with Verizon. I'm sure it's not the only student that Verizon has hired uh, out of Bentley College, but uh, we were very proud to have one of our own at the center uh, start working in the ethics and business conduct office at Verizon down in uh, Washington. Young lady from Maine who was scared to death to be going to the big city of D.C., but she's doing great. Um, I also should mention uh, that I'm very proud of the fact that the Center for Business Ethics has just completed its 30th year. Uh, so last year, the 2006, was our 30th anniversary year. So we're kind of celebrating that in part tonight, in addition to, uh, and this afternoon, in addition to Dr. White's uh, lecture. And I uh, just wanted you to know, many of you who may be here for the first time at Bentley, you may be freshmen, you may be sophomores or juniors, the Center for Business Ethics is located on this, uh, uh, this first floor, down at the other end of the hall, and you're always welcome to come down there. We encourage professors to uh, relate their assignments and paper topics to business ethics from time to time, and there's a, a very um, outstanding library at your center for business ethics uh, down at the end of the hall in this Damian uh, uh, Academic Center. <clears throat> 
Let me get to the introduction of a very good friend of mine and a very outstanding scholar who's going to be our ninth Verizon visiting uh, uh, professor uh, this afternoon, uh, Tom White. Uh, Tom and I go way back, uh, at least 20 years, uh, maybe longer in terms of our professional careers together. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge that his wife, uh, Lisa, has accompanied him here from California. And uh, Lisa, why don't you stand up and say hello to the audience. Uh, uh, you'll be able to see her at the reception as well. And uh, even though Tom's quite good looking, not near as good looking as Lisa. So. Uh, Tom White is the Hilton Professor of Business Ethics and Director of the Center for Ethics and Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Uh, Professor White received his doctorate in philosophy from Columbia University. Uh, his publications include four books, Right and Wrong, Discovering Philosophy, Business Ethics, and Men and Women at Work, and numerous articles on topics ranging from 16th century Renaissance humanism to business ethics. One of the reasons I admire Dr. White so much is the versatility um, that he has brought to his career in the area of philosophy, ethics, and uh, intellectual thought. To exemplify that, his book uh, entitled In Defense of Dolphins, The New Moral Frontier, which is being published by Blackwell Publishing uh, and is forthcoming in the next uh, month or so, addresses the ethical issues connected with human-dolphin interaction. And since I think 2007... Is it not the United Nations naming 2007 as the year of the dolphin? His book, there must have been some marketing uh, effort here, is coming out at a most uh, a perfect time uh, for that uh, uh, year of the dolphin um, put forward by the United Nations. I have read that book in a couple of different drafts. It is fascinating. And um, it talks, among other things, not only about dolphin-human interaction, but more specifically in relation to business ethics, about the deaths and injuries of dolphins in connection with the human fishing industry and the captivity of dolphins in the entertainment industry. Professor White is a scientific advisor to the Wild Dolphin Project, which is a research organization studying a community of Atlantic spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. And I might add as a footnote uh, that I know of no other philosopher, and perhaps beyond just knowing philosophers, there are not many uh, scholars who have done the kind of field work that Dr. White has done in in relation to his research with regard to dolphins. I mean, Tom has gone out on numerous trips uh, to literally be with dolphins and study their habitat, their habits, and their interaction with human beings, all in the name of trying to find out uh, the proper relationship and ethical um, interaction of, uh, of, of humans and dolphins and our responsibilities uh, not only to human beings but to life generally, uh, more specifically in this case to the life of, of, uh, of wild species that go beyond just the human species. So I think you're going, and here Dr. White is with us to talk about uh, information technology. So look at that kind of versatility, and uh, uh, that's why I'm quite envious and admiring of my friend and colleague uh, in his scholarly endeavors, and therefore 
welcome him here today as our Verizon visiting uh, professor. Uh, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, since this is a Verizon-sponsored event, I suppose I should start to check the mic by asking, can you hear me now? Uh, there'll be another plug for the company later on, but that's where, that's where we'll start. Thanks very much for uh, letting me be here. This is a great honor and uh, privilege. I'd also like to thank Mike very much for that warm introduction. I particularly like the fact that he didn't say, in describing the range of topics on which I work, here's a guy who can't pick something and settle down. He uh, said, well, there's a range of, of topics, so I very much appreciate that. Uh, I also want to take a minute to, um, in addition to thanking all of the people connected with the center and thanking Verizon for sponsoring the event and thanking Greg for coming up from New Jersey, uh, to uh, say a little something about the fact that this is the 30th anniversary or completing the 30th anniversary of the, uh, the Center for Business Ethics. Um, particularly because I'm aware in the world of academics you frequently uh, have a situation where uh, you have these wonderful people around you that you kind of take for granted simply because they're part of the furniture. Um, the Center for Business Ethics was founded 30 years ago by Mike Hoffman when business ethics was not a field. Business ethics was on no one's radar. And uh, the fact that business ethics has become so central in the study and the, the pursuit of business is in very uh, great measure due to the work of Mike Hoffman. Uh, Mike, in many ways, invented the field. He, he founded the center. The Center for Business Ethics at Bentley is the model that any of us who then set up other centers use when we say, well, what is it that we should do? Well, we look at Bentley to see what it is that we should be trying to set up. And I, I, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that the, the Center for Business Ethics here really is the premier center for business ethics on the planet. So you may think it's just an office down the hall, but those of us who are uh, in the field really just have huge respect for this, and it really is all due to the efforts of one person, Mike Hoffman. Uh, okay, getting down to business then. Um, as you gather, the title of my talk is Data, Dollars, and the Unintentional Subversion of Human Rights. Uh, I want to start with a couple of preliminaries because the um, I suspect this talk is going to be somewhat different from the others in this, uh, in this series. Uh, first of all, just as an informational matter, uh, I was told that I should talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, in fact, I did go back and say to Mark, 45 minutes, really? And he said, yes, 45 minutes. So if you have to worry about classes or feeding your cat or anything important like that, and you leave, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm fine with that. But, so that's, you can clock it accordingly. Uh, the discussion is going to be fairly broad. Uh, the reason for that is I think that we're at a juncture in the world of ethics and IT where uh, it's going to make more sense for me to talk about a wider range of issues, and hence I'll be uh, making more assertions than doing fairly detailed arguments. So uh, if anyone particularly uh, who is of a philosophical mindset is inclined to be kind of picky, be picky about broad points, not the small points, because the, the big points are what's going to matter. The general theme, though, that I'm working with is the matter of unintended negative consequences from otherwise well-intentioned actions. That is, things that we do presume will work out well, maybe they do, but then there's this other side to it that we haven't anticipated. And in many ways, much of what I'm talking about has to do with the belief system that underlies how we operate in business. And when I say that, I mean everybody. Corporations, consumers, investors, governmental reg regulatory agencies. So when I talk about business and I say broad, I mean the kinds of issues that I'm talking about today are ones that each one of us had a role in creating the current situation. And each one of us will have a role in changing it if we don't like what it is. So this has to do, again, with unintentional negative consequences, and I want to stress unintended, unintentional consequences, rather than something that was deliberate, and that this reflects the belief system about how business operates. The way I'm going to work is I'm going to talk, first of all, about some examples of this phenomenon in a non-IT industry, 
because it's going to be easier from the standpoint of identifying the history involved. Then talk about an IT industry. In each case, I'll describe some issues or events that I consider troubling, and then uh, if that's for me, I'm not here, by the way. Um, if, uh, and then move to the issue of what's the cause of those kinds of things, and some final uh, thoughts about what do we do with that kind of a situation. Okay. The first example I want to use, this business of unintended negative consequences, talk about a combination of the petroleum and auto industries. As I said, it's a non-IT issue, but I think a non-IT example, but I think it's an example of something where we can see that a variety of actions that we all intended to have positive consequences ended up with another side that we wouldn't have chosen if we had thought, and we probably certainly didn't see it coming. We want to start, when we talk about this, with the Arab oil embargo of 1973-1974. Uh, trust me, it gets more depressing every year as I talk about this kind of thing with my students, that most of the people in the room were not born in 1973-1974. Um, but nonetheless, that's where we have to start. Uh, those of us who lived through it remember that it was a cold winter, and because of the uh, unhappiness by the Arab states with American foreign policy, and, uh, the, and American media that uh, they decided to turn the spigot off. And so OPEC shut the spigot off for gasoline, for petroleum from that part of the world. It was a cold winter. The uh, response was, of course, that we needed to make do with less. The push was to keep public buildings at 55 degrees, and we had a shortage of gasoline. In fact, we then went really to gas rationing. We had gas lines long lines at gas stations. You could not buy gasoline every day. Uh, it, was, it really was very difficult. And those of us who lived through it, you could not take this as a more serious matter. Uh, and in fact, in the following spring, when the oil was flowing again, Jimmy Carter, who was president of, at the time, made this major address to the nation in which he tried to underscore just how bad the situation was and what we needed to do about it. Tonight we're having an unpleasant talk with you about a problem that's unprecedented in our history. With the exception of preventing war, this is the greatest challenge that our country will face during our lifetime. The energy crisis has not yet overwhelmed us, but it will if we do not act quickly. It's a problem that we will not be able to solve in the next few years, and it's likely to get progressively worse through the rest of this century. We must not be selfish or timid if we hope to have a decent world for our children and our grandchildren. We simply must balance our demand for energy with our rapidly shrinking resources. By acting now, we can control our future instead of letting the future control us. Two days from now, I will present to the Congress my energy proposals. Its members will be my partners, and they have already given me a great deal of valuable advice. Many of these proposals will be unpopular. Some will cause you to put up with inconveniences and to make sacrifices. The most important thing about these proposals is that the alternative may be a national catastrophe. Further delay can affect our strength and our power as a nation. Our decision about energy will test the character of the American people and the ability of the President and the Congress to govern this nation. This difficult effort will be the moral equivalent of war, except that we will be uniting our efforts to build and not to destroy. That was a very famous speak, a speech at the time, because here you have the President of the United States saying that uh, he needed to talk about the moral equivalent of war. And there was no way, as I said, that you could be living at the time and not take that as a very serious matter. Now, it would seem as though, given that, that there was no, there'd be no way that we could respond to that situation in a way that would be anything but positive, that would be anything but would, that would be a good way out of the problem. So let's look and see what happened. Well, first of all, in the next campaign, the attitude, the position that we get on the, uh, I guess we're having, there, that seems a little better. The attitude about how serious a problem this was, was taken issue with by Ronald Reagan, who 
claim that America has more than enough energy resources to meet our needs until the fuels of the future are developed. And of course, uh, Reagan won the election, and the attitude of the following administration was very different from what Carter had suggested. Consumers responded that once the oil started flowing again by building bigger houses, buying SUVs, and pickup trucks. In other words, we, in many ways, were trying to buy our way out of the situation. But the, but the belief, again, was we had solved the problem, we would handle things in the future, and we were moving in that direction. Automakers took advantage of the fact that the, the MPG standard, the famous CAFE, Corporate uh, Average Fuel Economy Standards for their fleets, differentiated between passenger cars and light trucks. SUVs are light trucks. The, it has a lower requirement for miles per gallon, and so they push those vehicles, which have a much greater profit margin than, uh, than passenger cars. So the market, consumers and producers, respond in a way that gets this working in this direction. And of course, we end up with the, with the Hummer, that 8,000 pound, 10 mile per gallon behemoth of a vehicle, which when you live in Los Angeles, you know you need one of these for all the time you're going to off, go off road, uh, which everybody does in, uh, in Boston, Washington, Chicago, and Los Angeles. The price of gasoline over 30 years, of course, goes up. Now, from a consumer standpoint, we say that's bad news. But historically, gasoline in the United States was always considered to be underpriced. And so more uh, revenue in that direction should produce more money for energy companies to do exploration in order to find more reserves. So everything is supposed to be working. Everything is supposed to be working well. <laughs> Ah, you live by, here we go. I tell my students, you live by high technology, you die by high technology. Okay, well, I'm okay with this. In any event, the, we have a situation where it looks like there's been nothing but upside after Carter's warning. So maybe Carter's warning wasn't so on the, on the mark. We have happy drivers, we have big cars, we have big houses, auto companies until fairly recently are making money. The um, energy companies are, according to the model of the way business should operate, everything should be working okay. But there's another side to things. If we look at consumption of energy in the U.S., between 1975 and 2005, it increases dramatically. 1975, we were burning 72 quadrillion BTUs. 2005, that's up substantially to 100 quadrillion. In terms of petroleum consumption, 1975, we're at 16 million, importing about a third of that. In 2005, we're up to 20 million, importing two-thirds of that. So, dicey situation, problematic situation now when you have a higher ratio of the petroleum, which is already, has already gone up, now coming from imports. And I think that getting to the issue of what's the unintended downside that while the model of how things should work, and whether as consumers or automakers or whatever, we all felt, okay, people are making money, people are buying, people are making cars, things are going well. When you then look to see what's the impact of that kind of increased petroleum use and that kind of increased import, I think that we have a situation where petroleum use was at least a contributing factor to two oil wars, which by the time everything is ended, will amount to more than 500,000 deaths. And in connection with this, I think it's important to remember that in 1991, there was a piece in Harper's Magazine that pointed out that between 1945 and 1991, there were 23 times in which one, company, one country invaded another. And there were only three times in which the United States got involved. In other words, there are always other issues than simply border. It becomes a matter of national imperative, national security, and petroleum is clearly a strategic resource. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it's a contributing factor. Something that most of us don't like to think of is that uh, I think there was an unintended negative consequence in terms of domestic security. The 9-11 uh, Commission report uh, pointed out that in 1998, in Osama bin Laden's first declaration of war against the United States, he cited that one of the reasons he was so upset was because of the, of the presence of American military in Saudi Arabia. 
because Saudi Arabia hosts the, the most holy sites of, uh, of Islam. And uh, it would be the equivalent of, of Iran parking you know, army and tanks in the Vatican. Uh, and that, and again, they were there in Saudi Arabia because of the first uh, Iraq war. And we even get now President Bush saying America is addicted to oil. In other words, President Bush is sounding very much like President Carter 30 years later. And so I think, again, that what we have is a situation where there, you know, while there was no intention to create a situation where there was something problematic about what was going on, I think that the, uh, the fact is that, that we contributed to a more risky situation than we knew we were. Okay, how does this kind of thing happen? How does it happen that in business, good people try to do good things that have a problematic outcome? Among the, among the reasons behind that are, on the one hand, what I call poverty of the a combination of poverty of the imagination and ethical illiteracy, and then what I consider to be a faulty conception of business, particularly in a democracy. Okay, what's poverty of the imagination and ethical illiteracy? Well, to keep it simple, very much the attitude that you cannot see beyond very narrow, a very narrow and very limited perspective. Poverty of the imagination, people who are afflicted with that really have tunnel vision, and they just cannot think broadly enough. Now, to do ethics well, you have to think imaginatively. You have to think broadly. And you also have to be able to think in a sophisticated way to recognize the various facets that there are with an ethical problem. Ethics is more complicated than most people think that it is, and I think that what part of what we've seen is that this combination of issues, poverty of the imagination, ethical illiteracy, was a factor in both consumer and corporate behavior in the petroleum and auto business. How so? I think that we were all affected by a very short-term, narrow perspective. We thought in terms of two months from now, six months from now, we thought in terms of corporate quarters. We did not think in terms of 10, 20, 30 years down the road. We also failed to recognize and fully appreciate the global implications of local buyer and seller behavior. There is a connection between what we do at the pump in Braintree and where the oil comes from. Yeah, it's an issue, issue of following the dollars because that then becomes a significant issue. And in terms of, again, imagination, you have to think broadly, particularly now that the, the business is global. You have to worry about what those interconnections are. Particularly in terms of ethical issues, I think we had a situation where there was a, an, a failure, again, on the part of all of us to recognize the risk of harm from our actions and to take appropriate action. That, strictly in terms of buying and selling of, of gasoline and automobiles in the, in the short run, but there's also the broader issue of the rights of future generations. Petroleum, all fossil fuels, are a limited resource. We have powered the entire economies of the world on that, and we're using them up in a way in which we basically say to future generations, well, you've got a problem, you better fix it. Uh, which in terms of the welfare of the species is not exactly the most responsible attitude. Now again, there was no, there was no intention here for anyone to do any harm to anyone else. But there is, and there was a belief that if you do business in this way, if you tend to the bottom line, if you respond to market, if you keep going, everything will work out well. But what I'm suggesting is that when you then have other issues that aren't, you aren't seeing, you know, that you don't see because you either aren't sensitive enough to the ethical issues or you aren't seeing because you aren't thinking imaginatively enough, sooner or later they're going to catch you from behind. Okay, the second big problem I see is what I consider to be a faulty conception of business, particularly business, the role of business in a democracy. Okay, let's start this way. Why do we have business? Well, if you're tempted immediately to say, well, to make profit or to increase shareholder wealth, don't say that, because that's not why we have business. Uh, those things are means to an end, but they are not the end in itself. And this is actually one of the reasons, one of the ways that this work on dolphins has been helpful to me, because it gives me a different perspective on, on 
the world of evolution, biology, and how species adapt. The reason that humans live together, as opposed to live solitary autonomous lives, the reason that we have communities with division of labor, specialization of labor, is because we get an easier life that way. Life is better for human beings when we specialize, when we organize societies where we have different things set up to give us different, you know, different goals. And what, what happens then is, for example, we have healthcare institutions that are supposed to be there to deliver us, you know, make sure we have a, a healthy situation. And I'm, the coach is calling for a timeout, and so take a minute. Okay. I think what we're going to do, uh, I'm sorry, Tom, because I know you like to walk and talk, but oh, I think we're going to have to okay. cancel the uh, lavalier mic. Okay. There's something wrong with it, and just use the podium mic. Let's see how that works. Okay, so back to the question, why is it that we have business? Humans have, uh, yeah. we organize society in a way that we have, you know, healthcare institutions, health as a part of the economy, government as a part of, uh, of the society, health as a part of the society, government as a part of the society, education as a part of the society, and all of those have particular jobs. The job of healthcare institutions give us health. The job of government, you know, domestic order and you know, handling power issues. The job of education, basic skills. Okay, what's the job of business? The job of business is to make it possible for us to get the material conditions of life, the stuff that we need, goods and services to make life comfortable. That's what it's there for. All these institutions and society are there to make life better for us. The only problem is that, particularly in a democracy, you need to recognize that business has to operate under certain restrictions because the idea is to provide us with a, a certain kind of life. Now, the restrictions you operate under in business is both the law and, more importantly, ethics, because we can't codify everything. And in a, in a society, in a democracy, where human rights are central, that is, we say, the kind of society we're going to have is one that takes those issues seriously, that then becomes a kind of limitation under which business has to operate. So the job of business then becomes to provide for the material welfare of the members of the society in a way consistent with basic human rights, but especially with the rights that power a democracy. What we have seen that, what we see then with the petroleum industry is that the faulty, we've had a faulty conception of business where consumer behavior and corporate strategy were, div were driven more by self-interest and narrow financial interest than ultimately what it is that we needed, which is a secure source of energy. Meeting material needs now is more expensive and more difficult rather than less expensive and less difficult. And we also have obvious issues of economic justice because with a critical commodity like energy, absolutely fundamental to life, the people who get hit worst are the people who have least. And that, it's, that then becomes that the lower people who have the, in the lower economic strata are the ones who end up with the hardest time while you have great wealth and great ease, clear issue of economic justice that has to be addressed. The moral of the story is, in this industry, good intentions, happy consumers, and profitable companies do not necessarily mean, and everybody lives happily ever after. Everybody tried to do the right thing. Some stuff happened that wasn't so swell. You can't just assume doing it by the book, everything's going to work out okay. Okay, that's one example. Now let's start talking about the IT industry. Now, there were two reasons I started with petroleum. First of all, we had a 30-year window to look at. And sometimes the consequences that we're talking about take decades to unroll. And the second reason is that I think that when we look at IT, we're talking about other really critical issues that and very fundamental values that are, that are at stake. And also, IT, the industry, is very much ahead of everybody else on this. They're very much you know, on the cutting edge of dealing with issues that other industries just don't have to deal with at all. So I think this is one of the reasons that there's this uh, real need to look at the centrality of all of this. And when I talk about the IT industry, I, I mean about anything connected with digital technology. Uh, computers, cell phones, iPods, RFID tags, satellite, you name it, if it's digital, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So we're talking about a very broad 
range of economic activity. Very quickly, uh, by the way, in this kind of thing, you have to understand uh, the difference between analog and digital technology. Uh, in analog technology, uh, you know, you'll have music or a speaker. Uh, you have electronic pulses that are then recorded and you know, can be replayed as music. With a digital technology, it's all about numbers. You take sound, you have a converter that converts it into numbers, you send the data, you convert it back from numbers to music. The fact that this is digital technology and that it's just zeros and ones, it's just numbers, it's just data stream, it's just data packets, means that this is a new world. Because digital, as opposed to analog, is much more efficient. You get, that's why you get 200 channels or 400 channels you know, on satellite, rather than smaller stuff you'd get over cable. That's why you get 400 songs, 600 songs on your iPod. Digital technology is extraordinary in the ability to packet information. And that's one of the reasons that with that technology, we now get some significant risks. The upside, I, I think there's no way that you can exaggerate the upside of the industry. It's a healthy and vibrant industry. We as consumers get regular technological advances. We get great services, great convenience, incredible productivity in business. You know, we get, uh, we get TiVo, we get DirecTV, we get Verizon, we get Sprint, we get cool stuff. We get laptops. There is no shortage of, you know, sort of the wow factor to this technology. You get phone service where you couldn't get it before. You get Wi-Fi where you couldn't get, get it before. You just get great stuff from this. And it's going to get better. I mean, and there's, there's a future in this. One of my favorite examples of the future potential of this kind of thing, this is a, a website off of an initiative of Virgin Life Care, which is a new initiative that Virgin Life Care, IBM, and uh, at least the, uh, the gym that I belong to uh, is involved with because the idea here now is to find a way to help businesses address that expense that you have no control over, health care. Healthcare insurance, healthcare for your employees. And the plan now is that if you can give companies enough data on their, the fact that their employees' health is improving, you can negotiate a better package with your healthcare insurance provider. And indeed, the deal is you get your employees to wear this. Well, it looks like just a pedometer, but it's more than that because you upload it. And you upload this to your Health Miles site. It tracks your activity, and not only does your company, through its you know, sort of batching all the data together, get over time and evidence that the pr profile of your employees are being you know, is improving, but there's this business over here, Health Miles. As you hit certain goals, you get money. I mean, you get gift cards and things, and so it's all about incentives, and it's made possible by the fact that you un upload digital data to a website. Companies benefit, employees benefit. Seems like the proverbial win-win scenario. And this is just a kind of, you know, other possibility that you get because of the nature of the technology. However, as you can see it coming, there's going to be this other side to things. There is the issue of unintentional negative consequences. And again, one of the reasons I think it's important for us to talk about this now is that we're on the verge of the, well, we're in the middle of the explosion of this technology, and we also have to appreciate the fact that uh, unless we tend to issues now that, uh, that are at least right now somewhat problematic, down the road we could have a very serious matter because we'd be in too deep. So what could be some of the downside on, on the industry? Well, first of all, while this issue, as an issue, this is fading somewhat, I found troubling from the beginning the whole, the whole matter of the way that the record industry handled the illegal downloading business. The RIAA, the Recording Industry Association of America, um, a few years ago decided that after ignoring the issue of downloading for years, and why they downloaded it is a whole other story, why they ignored it was a whole other story, uh, they decided that they were then going to get very aggressive uh, they, uh, they started using a law that allowed subpoenas to be issued by clerks, not even judges, and they asked all the ISPs for information to identify end users who might be doing, um, uh, who might be doing illegal downloading. 
Uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, Verizon, as far as I know, was the only company that resisted the uh, request of the RIAA and engaged in what I'm sure was a pretty expensive legal uh, tussle with the RIAA until it was declared that the RIAA did not have the legal right to that information. And uh, not only, as I said, was it troubling that the RIAA took such a heavy-handed approach on this, but it was just as troubling, if not more, that most of the other companies kind of played along and handed the information over. Uh, but the, uh, the strategy of the industry was get aggressive, get data, you know, get information, ID people, and sue them. Um, now, while the uh, issue of music downloading has been going away somewhat, the issue of movie downloading has not. But what has always concerned me from the beginning was the fact that the way that illegal downloading was being portrayed by the industry. And here's a clip, this is an example of, of, from the film industry, how it views illegal downloading. So let me run that, and then we'll talk. Oh, damn. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's on WGBH. So, okay, we'll, get, we'll, we'll run up to that. So first of all, there's this whole issue of the troubling business of the, uh, uh, the RIAA. Now, uh, there's a whole other area of concerns, which is had to do with the uh, involvement of Microsoft, Cisco, Google, and Yahoo in China. Uh, most of you probably have heard about this, where uh, last year, Congress, one of the uh, congressional committees, called executives from these companies up to ask them about why it was that they were, in their doing business with China, had censorship going on with their search engines, and Yahoo, who was the uh, kind of the uh, seen as the worst uh, in this because Yahoo had not only been involved in the censorship uh, of uh, those incredibly dangerous terms like freedom and democracy, which if you're doing searches on that in China through these search engines you couldn't get anywhere with, but Yahoo had provided information to the Chinese government that ended up with uh, two reporters being jailed. And so Congress is going out, you know, called the executives up and said, why? How is this making any sense at all? But what we're finding is that you have the situation where in order to do business in China, the companies had to operate according to Chinese law, according to the demands of the government. But what you have is a very significant limitation on issues of free expression uh, and uh, obviously uh, getting information that might somehow promote uh, freedom and democracy. Closer to home, some other troubling events uh, was revealed last year that the National Security Agency had asked a number of telecommunication companies for information on our uh, phone activity, and there is now a massive database on all of that. Uh, the Department of Justice has asked all the ISPs to hold search information for two years. Most of them are letting, had been letting things go after about six months, but uh, the Justice Department would like that information held for searches search activity for a couple of years in case it's necessary for criminal investigations. Uh, it was revealed that America Online posted uh, three months worth of query logs on, uh, of 650,000 customers. Now, in theory, you can't, you can't put that activity together with individuals. But you know what? You could. And so they said, oh, we're sorry. It was a terrible mistake. But you know, what people were doing on the Internet clearly was there, and even closer to home, you, I'm sure everybody in this room knows about what happened with TJX, the fact that uh, they lost a lot of information about their customers and credit cards history. You know, they got hacked in, and you, know, you lose all, the, all that information. The scariest development, though, if those things are just fall into the troubling side of things in the business, what I consider to be the scariest thing coming down the, the pike in terms of the IT industry, and again, negative unintended consequences, is radio frequency ID tags. Uh, these are, now if you, if you drive the turnpike and you have a, what's a fast lane tag, that's RFID. If you have, uh, if you can see anything that looks like this kind of thing, it's a microchip with an antenna around it. What it does, I'll give you sort of the short version, it allows, it's a passive device that allows it to be identified and these can be so small as to be uh, tags on your clothing or put in shoes or into credit cards, and you don't even know that they're there. 
But what they can do, again, this is just a really quick version of uh, description of the technology. What they can do is identify you, what you've bought, where you are, your, your buying history. It's just remarkable. It really does amount to uh, very significant uh, information about you, your location, your personal activity. And not, not simply something that's troubling, but what I think one is one of the most depressing things about all of this in terms of the downside. If after Yahoo found that the information they had handed over to the Chinese government landed two reporters in jail, if the senior management went to the board and said, you know, we think the right thing to do is for us not to do business in China because it's not for what we stand, I have no doubt that those people would have been fired or they would have been told, wrong decision, go back and change your mind, find a way to make it work. If they had announced that, that they nonetheless were going to do it, Wall Street would have hammered them. Pension funds would have dropped them overnight because there's so much money involved. China is so big that I have no doubt that people would have said, look, we aren't happy with this, you've got to do it. So in many ways, you know, the companies that, that you might want to gripe about in this regard are being squeezed by everybody else. So again, this is a situation that I'm talking about. We've all, we all have a hand in. You know, consumers, producers, investors, and the like. The unintended downside then in this regard is in terms of what I've, you know, some of the things I've been ticking off, the initial response of the IRIA, RIAA on music, privacy issues with China, and uh, even onshore with uh, internet uh, activity being logged. We have significant threats to human rights, everything from a kind of basic respect, privacy, freedom of expression, access to information critical to your welfare. And we also get, I think, a problematic relationship of between business, government, and the law. I think that it's unfortunate that the typical attitude of most corporations has been, well, you know, the government is making a legitimate request, we have to hand that over. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that's something we need to revisit. Uh, it makes it more difficult to do business, but I do think this is a, a problematic relationship because, as one critic has put it, the industry is then in many ways, business in many ways is becoming an arm of the government, which is something that uh, can become a troubling issue. The other unintended downside in regard to all of this, clearly less in life is private. Yeah. Personal information is not protected, although we might be told that it is. It just, and what, what, it, what we find out are the issues that might have been simply in somebody's diary, your curiosity, your health records, all of those things can be, can be accessed. In fact, when Mike commented that, uh, you know, I, had, I sort of had high tech stuff on the, on the podium, uh, he was pointing out the fact that I am a self-confessed data junkie. I am a data junkie. I am a, I am a, uh, a tech addict. Uh, you know, I've got TiVo. I've got, uh, I, do, I live on my computer. I do all my email, all my buying. I have the coolest cell phone you can imagine because it's not just a cell phone. It's got web access. It's got you know, all the office uh, software. It's got, it's got video. It's got camera. You can do web surfing. It's got GPS. Uh, you put all that stuff together, though, and think of how much inf Now, it's, that's all uploaded somewhere. Think of what kind of a picture you can get of me. There's not much of my life that wouldn't be visible. What I, what I surf on the net, what I, what I buy, what I don't buy, what I'm curious about, who I talk to, what, what, I, you know, what I write to people, it's a massive amount of data. And you know what? I've given it away. This is not something where you know, somebody stole that information. I've uploaded all of that. And I think that if you th each one of you think about how much information you've given away about yourself, when you talk about privacy, this is not just a matter of, you know, what is Verizon doing to protect my privacy? You gave them the information. This is something that cuts both ways. The moral of the story then, good intentions, happy consumers and profitable companies do not necessarily mean, and everybody lives happily ever after. How does this happen? Let's go back to poverty of the imagination, ethical illiteracy, and a faulty conception of business in a democracy. Well, 
Poverty of the imagination, ethical illiteracy again, this really short-sighted view on things. And now we're back to where I thought I was about 10 minutes ago, where in this case, in fact, the illegal downloading issue, because it's uh, getting close to being resolved, isn't exactly central to the theme of the, of the talk. Uh, it's not cutting edge, but the way that the industry is, has characterized this has bothered me for so long that I figured, what the hell, I'm going to take advantage of using the opportunity to talk about it. This is, this is now the film industry's version of why illegal downloading is wrong, and it tells you it's very much what the music industry was pushing. Okay, illegal downloading. It's like smashing into a uh, Mercedes and uh, stealing something. It's like walking into a, a DVD store and taking a DVD off the shelf. It's like stealing somebody's purse. It's stealing. Is it? Well, I don't think so. It's not, and, and part of the issue is here, there are clearly ethical issues related to illegal downloading. But let's look at what illegal downloading is in real life. And remember that if it's supposed to be like stealing something off a shelf, then you've got to look for all that adrenaline and sneaking in and sneaking around. Now, this is, this, is if, this is the best example I could do. We weren't going to demonstrate illegal downloading. This is legal downloading, but it would be the same thing. This is the iTunes store. And so you would go to the iTunes store, and you, of course, would see, you know, or you would have gone to Napster and seen all of your choices. You then, of course, can search on what you're looking for, you find what you're looking for, you download it. And then, of course, you dance. Now, that was, that was illegal downloading. I mean, that was legal downloading, but that was Ill, that's the process. Was that stealing? Was that walking in and taking something off the shelf? Well, I don't know about you. I didn't get the rush of adrenaline of trying to run out the store and not be caught. Because the issue is that digital theft is different and has to be addressed that way. Um, now, here's an example that's closer to home of what digital theft is. I walk into a bookstore. I pick up a book of the world's best jokes. I look at one, and I put the book back on the shelf, and I walk out. And a friend of mine says, so, how are you doing? And I say, a piece of string walks into a bar. <laughs> he hops up on the bar and orders a beer from the bartender. And the bartender says, get out of here. We don't serve your kind. And so the piece of string goes out, goes around the corner, messes up his hair, goes back in to the bar, hops up on the bar, says, I'd like a beer. And the bartender says, aren't you the piece of string I just threw out of here? And the piece of string says, no, I'm afraid not. Now, that actually won a contest on national public radio. <laughs> but that's more like what it is. I got the information. I reproduced it. The book is still on the shelf in the bookstore. It can still be used. Or here's another example of digital shift. Imagine that we take a file. Imagine this is a, you know, it can be a song. It can be a book. You want another copy? Fine. You want another copy? Fine. Digital theft is cloning. Digital copying is cloning. You can't tell the difference. In other words, you're reproducing something new. You aren't necessarily taking what somebody owned. What's at issue is ownership rights. What's at issue is copying rights and permissions. But it's not stealing. From an ethical standpoint, it's very different. And so what we get is this matter for, that I see from the standpoint of ethical illiteracy. The whole problem with the illegal downloading campaign is a failure to understand ethical issues connected with digital technology. It's in many ways, the traditional argument on this has been an analog argument for a digital 
infraction. And also a questionable strategy that's been used against so-called pirates because of the heavy-handed uh, strategy of the record industry. As it relates to corporate defense of censorship in China and privacy issues, the two major arguments we've gotten from companies are, well, we obey the law in China, and the benefits outweigh any harms. Well, the legal and the difference between the legal and the moral is what people learn in their first week in an ethics class. You can't necessarily say just because it's legal, it's right. It's not, and particularly when you're dealing with, an art, with, a government, with governments that have questionable records on human rights, you can't say that is a, enough of a defense. Benefits outweigh the harms. To easily becomes a matter of saying the ends justify the means. Also, we then again have this issue of failing to appreciate the risks of digital technology to basic human rights, everything from privacy, liberty, consent, right to know. Lots of, you know, you may be, some of you may already be wearing RFID tags and not know it. There's uh, this whole issue of whether um, that can, it's okay to do that without telling consumers. Respect for human dignity, ownership, a variety of rights that are on the line here that are potentially compromised because of the way we, as consumers and also buyers and sellers, uh, have been operating with all of this. And then the way that this evidence is a faulty conception of business, I think that we have, again, a failure to recognize the limitations on business placed by the need to respect fundamental human rights that are critical to democracy. I think, and I think one of the best examples of this, if the Postal Service had rolled out Gmail before Google did and said, we're going to make our money, we're going to pay for this with advertising, and did the same kind of content scanning that Gmail does, everybody would have been uproar saying the Postal Office is, is, is scanning our mail, because then what we have between that, RFID, and the rest is the, the unfortunate potential of a surveillance society. In many ways, we're there. We have a surveillance society, or we're close to it, and I think we've gotten there because we've been so enamored with the upside that we haven't been sensitive enough to the downside of the uh, industry, of the benefits, and also I think we get what I'd call a commodification of the inner life. Uh, the attitude now is if you can track people's inner world and you can make money off of it, store it and sell it, it's a good thing. I think we all have to rethink that proposition. Finally, what do we do about this? Well, mainly we just have to, I think, start by having a more sophisticated approach to ethics in business. And again, I think that goes for all of us, consumers and producers alike. I also think the most important thing is we have to recognize our mutual responsibility on this. Corporations, especially global corporations, are now out in front. In many ways, corporations have, have transcended nation states as forces on the planet for uh, protecting rights. Wall Street has to recognize its role. As I said, I have no doubt that if any of the, I, any of the big uh, companies had said we aren't going to do business in China, they would have been punished by Wall Street. Uh, consumers, have, we have to appreciate where, you know, what information we're giving away, where our money is going, and what the government has to take a look at, at this kind of thing. Congress you know, hammered the executives from uh, Google and Yahoo and Microsoft. Well, you know, if the government took a position in the same way that they did on the Foreign Correct Practices Act, it might support, uh, support companies so that they may not feel as though they're out there all alone. But bottom line on all of this is we all have to remember good intentions, Happy consumers and profitable companies do not necessarily mean and everybody lives happily ever after. But so that you don't feel as though I'm ending on too negative a note, uh, you've been a, you know, a good and patient audience, and so now you get the rest of the song. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we have uh, Jody and we have Eddie. Jeff, sorry. We're going to bring around a microphone for those of you who would like to ask uh, Dr. White some questions. Um, who has the first question? Here's one. 
right. Uh, I have a question. When you were saying how we have to get corporations to recognize, you know, uh, basically business ethics, how do you propose us going into the business world actually enacting that plan and coming forth and making everyone realize? Uh, good question. You know, what do, we, what do we do, especially if you're just about to go into the business world, what's your role? I think this has to do with the function that you're going in, what part of business you're going into, because the role of IT is different in different areas. Uh, HR, you've got very significant issues of storage of private information, and I think that one of the things that anyone who's going into that world has to do, first of all, is to become conversant with the technology to understand what you can and cannot promise about as far as security. If you are in marketing, you have to rein in the idea that uh, getting new information on consumers is necessarily a good thing. Uh, for example, uh, okay, this is a, this is a, ped a pedometer. I'll, I'll confess the fact that uh, after working on this, I got so spooked that I had to take this thing apart to see if there was already an I RFID tag in here. There wasn't. Uh, it just uploads the information you put it in. But if I, wanted, if I were a, a, a new marketing person and wanted to impress my boss and I had a feel for the technology, I'd say, oh, let's, uh, and let's say I work for Dunkin' Donuts. And I say, you know, let's put together something where we partner with Verizon and Dunkin' Donuts and maybe some other upscale uh, stores, retail operations, and we put an RFID tag in here. And we uh, find a way to get it activated, and that when it does a special text message that we'll call D-mail, goes to your, you know, when you're like within 300 yards of a Dunkin' Donuts. And if you, or an REI, or one of those other things, and, you know, if you get the message and you, you we can set it up in any, any number of ways. We, you can go and do online buying or you go into the store, but the, we, what we try to do is to track you and then give you an incentive to let us get that information. And of course, this is GPS activated, so we know where you, where you are. Now, from a marketing standpoint, I'm thinking, my boss is going to love this. I found a way to track consumers to get information on their buying to then time it so that I can find out through a series of these things what they like and what they don't like and then target advertising better through this. In terms of trying to impress my boss, I think I've got something. On the other hand, I've just said, let's follow everybody around and get all of their information. And I'd say one of the things, you know, if you're going into marketing, what you have to do is to say, where's the point at which we say this is too invasive? Uh, sales, there have been some, there's been some other kinds of some issues related to what counts as appropriate behavior. I think that that, as I said, knowing the technology, mastering the technology, knowing how it works in your function, and then recognizing where the line is crossed. Now, one of the things that's critical for you all to know, you know, in, in your 20s, you have a much better feel for the technology than people, certainly in their, for most people, in their 40s and 50s. And so when you bring in ideas, you're going to have a better feel for What's too extreme? Uh, it's not a great answer, but it's going to depend a lot on where you where you where you end up, and you're going you're going to in fact in a much better position because of your the way you use the technology so well. You're going to be in a better position to make it plain to uh, people you know to whom you report what the vulnerabilities of the technology are. It was a good question. Thanks for asking that. Next question. Oh, there's one up there. Thanks, Jeff. And in anticipation, who has the next one? Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, during the 1980s, the British Phonograph Association did a similar thing to the RIA, where they made a famous logo of a cassette tape with uh, crossbones on it to make mm -hmm. it look like a pirate flag. And they said that home taping was killing music and that it was illegal and that they would take action. Uh, when the VCR came out, uh, many movie companies were claiming that it would be the death of movies. When cable came out, uh, many movie theaters said it would be the death of movie theaters, and obviously it hasn't. Uh, what do you think the correct response of the RIA and the MPAA should be in this case? 
Uh, the question was, uh, the gentleman ticked off precedents about how um, the cassette tape, uh, VCR, other technologies were always uh, being touted as the, the doom of a particular industry. And so your question was, what do I think is the, sort of the appropriate uh, response then of the RIAA? And this also relates to, to film downloading. Uh, I think f the first part of your question points out that the predictions that, oh, this is going to kill our industry, this is killing our industry, tend to be exaggerated that it usually, it usually doesn't happen. But I think that part of what it does do is to, is to point out that with, with technology, you get significant shifts about where your revenue stream is going to come from and how you can manage that. For example, AOL you know, launched itself as a business that would make money by giving people access to the Internet. It's free now. They, they still have some of that kind of thing, but what they've done is recognize that there are other ways of making money, and there's also now much more widespread free access to the Internet. So I think what, the, what in the music industry, and, and you, know, you actually started seeing this with iTunes, and more recently because of the pressure from the EU, Steve Jobs last week, I think it was, said, well, maybe we need to rethink this whole business of ownership of you know, limitations on how you play, a, you know, what you can play you know, when you get something from iTunes. I think that what we're seeing is the industry recognizing that uh, the claim that there is, this is going to cause the industry to go up in smoke, first of all, isn't true. There are ways that you can manage this in a way that don't alienate your customers and that you have to be responsive to the technology. Uh, one thing that I alluded to briefly, now, that I want to mention, because this, this, this does get to, again, one of the issues of poverty of the imagination. I remember reading when Napster was a big story that one of, the way that one of the major executives in the industry, record industry, learned about Napster was the following way. Now, I read it as a news story. Maybe it was apocryphal, but I read it as a news story. One night, he was at dinner, and his granddaughter came up and said, Grandpa, what's your favorite song? And he told her, and she went upstairs, downloaded it off of Napster, and came with her laptop and played the song. And he said, how'd you do that? Well, if you're the head of a recording studio and you don't know about digital technology, <laughs> there's something wrong. And so again, part of this is that uh, I, I think that with the, the RIAA in particular, there was not an appreciation of what the nature of the technology was, what the, how users regard it. And I think uh, that, at, so what we've seen is, in fact, it's kind of becoming sort of a passe issue, but I think what that shows was that that was not the best response. I think that the industry all along should have launched something that would undercut something like Napster, the 99 cent song off of, off of iTunes, which has now become the norm of some of the other sites. I think, you know, again, it's the, you look, you, you appreciate the fact that business is changing, you've got to be nimble. And if you're going to use this technology, it's going to change, and it's going to change the way you make money. It's going to end some possibilities, and it's going to open up some other possibilities. Um, some of our uh, information technology experts here are our guest section. Got a question? Or is this just for the kids? <coughs> Yes. Just for a moment, I'd like to go beyond the IT area. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion today, what is the biggest area that you think business leaders still just don't get when it comes to ethics? Great question. Uh, I think that uh, now, I say this on the basis of the fact that I've been uh, doing business ethics since the 70s, that uh, I've been aware of the development of the corporate ethics program. I've obviously uh, been very closely interested in the way ethics has gotten uh, addressed or not addressed. And I think that the biggest challenge is to not simply have a more sophisticated understanding of ethics, but I think what that means is to do ethics all the way through the organization. And when I say that, what I mean is that my impression, and I say this also from knowing a fair amount about what goes on with corporate ethics programs, 
is that corporate ethics is too often limited to matters of, the way I put it, keeping the help from stealing the silver. That it's too much internal and it doesn't go high enough in the organizations. And I talk to a lot of corporate ethics people who are frustrated that their perspective, which is a critical perspective, doesn't get heard high enough in the organization. Ethics needs more of a seat at the table. Uh, ethics needs to be seen not only in terms of internal management, but strategy. Uh, issues of, of corporate governance with board membership, executive compensation, I mean, all these things. I think if you take ethics seriously, you really have to take it seriously. And I think right now that's the big challenge, that I think ethics has been limited. It's done, done, we've done a lot of good work at this point. But I think, for example, that some of what I was talking about, it were, these were issues that people, for example, in corporate ethics programs could have flagged early on into senior management as strategy issues. And I think that there's no kind of one particular issue that I'd say would be, but it was a great question because I think that uh, as, and this, this I think is especially important for global organizations. Uh, there are many ways, and other people have argued this, that the multinational corporate corporation has eclipsed the nation state, has much greater reach over in the, on, on the planet. And that, with that reach comes responsibility. And I think that it's a new role for corporate executives to play, but I think that it's one that, again, you just can't say, well, it's okay, you know, this is what the China, this is what the, the laws of China tell us to do, this is what the laws of the U.S. tell us to do. You're the same company. You have to have that sense of, of commitment to a set of values which are in everything that you do all the way over the planet. That's tough. I mean, what I'm saying is not easy. And it's not meant to kind of criticize what's been going on, but I think that's the next big challenge. I think we have uh, enough time for maybe one more question. Yes. Uh, Jeff? I'd be interested in your opinion on the, your perception of the role our government has been playing, particularly in maybe the last 10 years. Uh, where partisanship seems to get stronger, special interest, environmental issues, and how the government plays its role in the message that it sends to corporate America and the consumer in America uh, as to who has primary responsibility uh, in grooming our society, if you will. Uh, that's a really great question because it does get into this, this fundamental issue of the relationship between business, government, and, you know, and us as citizens. Uh, my opinion is, is I mean, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of the way things have gone in the last decade. I don't think that the position that has tended to dominate in the, certainly at the federal level has helped either consumers or businesses. I think that, frankly, the IT industry was left to hang out and, and dry for, you know, they were hang out by themselves in China. Uh, I think it was abdicating responsibility for the government to pretty much say, you know, look, we'll kick you around, but we won't give, we won't give you any help. I think that the, uh, the government also put the uh, telecommunications companies, ISPs, I think they put them in a terrible position by saying, look, we're asking you to do something that 10 years down the road you may find out is illegal in terms of what your privacy promises already are. And I think that that didn't help consumers. I don't think that helped businesses. I think we've, from the standpoint of trying to have an environment in which business is supported. I mean, business is critical as government and, and healthcare in the industry is to what it is that we need to be profitable and to have the kind of life that is meaningful for us. And I think that for some reason, the policies that we've been, that we've been seeing, uh, particularly at the federal level, have not consistently advocated the kind of uh, policies and standards and support that we need in order for business to say, yeah, I'm okay with this. I, you know, we're all in this together. And, and also to have, get the sense that consumers can feel the same way. There's been very much the sense of putting people at polar opposites with one another uh, and not a sense of a kind of mutual partnership, which I think is critical to make this kind of thing work. And I think that, uh, I mean, obviously, as you get, the, just from the fact of the way that I, you know, you know use, the, use this, um, uh, the technology, 
I am a huge fan of this industry. I use, use this stuff all the time. I'm very sensitive to the, the, the risks connected with it, uh, but I don't think that it's an industry that has gotten, from the standpoint of view as consumers or companies, adequate support and help from, uh, from the government. And I think that the government, as I said, has abdicated its responsibility in many ways and that it's many times left companies and consumers going at it against one another when we all have the same interest. Thank you, Tom. That was a wealth of information that I need. To <laughs> Thank you. Hope that was okay. Thank you very much.